Hi everybody, I'm Steve. Hello, thanks for having me. Hey, uh, I really enjoy RuPai. I was here last year, well not here, but you know, in Bruno, um, and really enjoyed it. And this conference is pretty awesome, so uh, thanks for having me a ton. Um, I have been programming Ruby for a very long time. Thank you. I've been programming in Ruby for a while now. Um, I'm actually a member of the Rails team. Um, and now uh, what I really, really enjoy is this new programming language called Rust. So I like to say that I will only program in languages that start with RU, um, basically. So I don't know what I'm going to do afterwards. I don't know if there's other good names that start with RU. But yeah, I literally have a Ruby tattoo. But I'm going to talk to you about Rust today instead of Ruby, because whatever. It's way more interesting. So um, right, let's, let's get going. So Rust. I'm really, really excited about Rust. Basically, um, last year, around Christmas time, I was at home visiting my mom. And uh, so, of course, I was just sitting on the internet all day, bored. And uh, she's great, but um, I saw this release, release announcement go by saying, Rust 0.5 has been released. And I'd heard about Rust because um, my friends in college are all operating systems PhDs, and we had been writing an operating system in the D programming language for a couple of years. And so um, Rust was something that we'd heard was another viable successor to C++, but was super early on. That was basically all that I knew about it. But I was looking for something to do over break, and I enjoy learning new programming languages, so I decided to learn what I could about Rust. When I decided to look at their documentation for that 0.5 release, I thought it was really terrible. So what I decided to do was write down everything that I had learned in order, um, because that's, that could be new documentation. And uh, I was working on some other books that I was writing, and I was working on the tool chain for generating those books. So it was tons of fun to uh, be a total newbie again. Um, I've been programming in Ruby for years. I know how Ruby works very well. I enjoy being an expert at Ruby, but there's definitely something to be said for starting all over again in a brand new language where you don't know anything, right? That's really exciting. So. For me, that's sort of what Rust represents. And after I read uh, the initial stuff about Rust, the reason I decided to keep learning it is because um, I think Rust is sort of the opposite of Ruby, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but basically, that's sort of the summary. So Rust is a programming language. Basically, it is a good choice when you would choose C++. So that's the sort of the, the why you would use Rust or not. Um, sometimes other things too. But that's the, the biggest users of Rust will be people that do C++ work. This tends to be a dynamic language conference. And so one of the reasons why, um, at least so far anyway, this year, right, all the languages that are in the title are dynamic. So I thought it would be cool to talk about Rust because it is not dynamic. Um, and this sort of comes into what I said about it being the opposite of Ruby. So let's talk about the language. And then I'm going to show you 10 things that I really enjoy about Rust. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to learn more on your own if your interest is peaked. So I'm not going to give you a full introduction. This is just going to be uh, some little tasty tidbits uh, and some things that I find to be really interesting. Um, so, OK, about the language. So Rust was originally written by Graydon Hoare. Um, and basically, he's a guy who works at Mozilla. He wanted to write a C++ compiler until he started to read more about C++. Um, so he got he wrote, he wrote the little basics of it, but as he was implementing all the details, he said, this is really terrible. So I'm going to invent a new programming language that's better. And this is a story that has happened countless times, right? You get really, really mad at your language, and you're like, I'm going to do better. Screw this. Um, but he actually had some skill at designing programming languages, and so spent a couple years making this work. And Graydon worked at Mozilla, so he started telling his coworkers about this new language that he had written. and. Basically, they were like, oh, that's cool, but tell me when it works a little bit better. So after a couple of years of this, he finally had what, the beginnings of a viable programming language. Uh, Brendan Eich, the CTO of Mozilla, decided that it was the time to open an R&D division of, of Mozilla. So he said to Graydon, this sounds like this could be a project that's good for Mozilla. Uh, if you can convince me, uh, this could be the first project under Mozilla's R&D division. And Graydon did a good job of explaining wh why it would be good. And so Mozilla decided to take it on as an official project and put a couple people onto it. Um, Graydon is now gone. He's not uh, working on the project anymore as of a couple months ago. But since that time, that was about three years ago, I think, um, Rust has been under active development with multiple people being paid by Mozilla to make the language. So there's a pretty serious backing behind it, unlike many um, small programming languages that are written in people's free time that end up failing because you get busy or you need to take a job or you get tired of doing it. So right now, basically, yeah, it's Mozilla's programming language. Um, Mozilla writes a ton of C++ for Firefox, and so they know exactly how painful writing C++ can be. 
right? So people who generally these days pick C++ because they have to, not because they want to. There are some people that like C++, but most people need C++ more than like C++. Um, so it's trying to fix the things that are the matter um, with C++. Okay, so Mozilla's in charge. Um, before I talk about the usage real quick, I mentioned that I thought that Ruby was sort of the opposite of Rust. So the, the sort of simple pitch for Rust is the speed of C++, the type system of Haskell or ML, and the concurrency of Erlang. And I thought, huh, speed, types, concurrency, that's like the anti-Ruby, right? That's like everything that Ruby is absolutely terrible about. So when I learn new things, I like to learn things that are as opposite as possible so that I can learn as much as possible. So that's sort of the three-part description of Rust. Um, so Rust's usage today at this moment primarily consists of Rust itself. So the original compiler was written in OCaml and then eventually it has been rewritten um, in Rust and Rust is almost entirely in Rust at this point. There's a teeny, teeny little bit that is not. Um, and Mozilla is developing a browser rendering engine called Servo um, in Rust as well. So we'll talk about that. Um, so Servo is basically how Graydon convinced Brandon, Brendan, Brandon or Brendan? Brendan, uh, that M Mozilla should take stewardship of Rust. So Servo is a web rendering engine. And what I mean by that is it is like Gecko or WebKit. Um, now, you might think it's sort of weird that Mozilla has Gecko, so why are they gonna build another thing that's the same as Gecko, right? Well, they're not actually planning on replacing Gecko with WebKit because there's been so much time and investment, all of the things that, um, you know, the extensions around Firefox would need to be rewritten, that's a super big long-term thing. Um, so Servo is specifically focused on mobile devices and working well on mobile. Um, Samsung recently announced a partnership with Mozilla where they have committed people to work on Rust full-time in order to get Servo working on mobile and working well. So, you know, Firefox OS is a browser and mobile. You know, I'm not saying Firefox OS will use Servo, but you can imagine that's probably the use case. Since I don't work for Mozilla, I can sort of say some things they're not willing to say necessarily that I think. So that's sort of what I think is that like Firefox OS will be using um, Servo. But uh, the cool thing about Servo is when I said that it has the concurrency of Erlang, the idea is that Servo is a rendering engine that is massively parallel. So the rendering engine is in a task, and I'll talk about tasks, what tasks are later. Um, the rendering and the actual like compositing is in a task. The layout engine is in a task. Each asset gets downloaded in parallel in a task. So it should be super, super fast um, due to this parallelism. Um, and so but Servo, I believe it's somewhere in the order of 60 or 70,000 lines of Rust code at this point. And as of today, it passes the ACID 1 test and they're working on ACID 2. So it's still a little bit early along. You can like read Wikipedia and sites like that and that's about it at this point. Um, so that's sort of how they're working on stuff. This also is really cool because it means that the language is not just done for academic concerns. They're actually learning about how to use the language by using it in the project as well while they're building the language. So one of the things that DHH always says about Rails that he enjoys is that he built Basecamp and then extracted Rails out of Basecamp. So everything in Rails came from practical necessity, at least in the beginning. Um, Rust should be uh, informed by the way that things are done in Servo. So since they're building a real application with this language, um, it, they've made certain decisions. Uh, there's actually entire features in the language that have been removed because they were too awkward to use in Servo. So Mozilla said, all right, that's not practical. Throw it out. Let's do something else. Um, so that's kind of neat. Um, so throwing it out. Let's talk about stability. Uh, Rust is currently a version 0 0.8. As you can imagine, this means that it is not ready for production whatsoever. Um, that said, there's at least one production install of Rust uh, going on right now. Um, a startup I read recently is using it for some things, which is interesting. But the releases from um, up to 0 0.8 are more like snapshots every three months of Rust development. They're not guarantees of backwards compatibility because Rust follows Semver, basically. So be below 1.0, Semver means Wild West. Those numbers don't mean anything, right? So there's been 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Um, there probably will be a 0 0.9 and maybe a 0 0.10 and maybe even a 0.11. Um, I'll talk about that a little bit. But basically, uh, yeah, they're snapshots and not backwards compatible with each other. People sort of assume that you are running relatively close to edge if you go into IRC and ask people questions. Um, and 1.0, uh, I just found this out yesterday, 1.0 is coming soon. So I, I don't know what that means. Um, there was a thread on the mailing list a couple days ago that basically said, hey, we're gonna be reprioritizing features and working aggressively towards getting a 1.0 out the door so that people can start using this in production. So hopefully soon uh, it will be ready. I don't know what that means other than soon. Um, so 
this is also why it's exciting. So I've often said that I don't want to program in Node.js because the community is too early, but, like, no, uh, but Rust is even more early than that. Right? So this is a super exciting time because you can have a massive impact as an individual programmer. Right? So um, my Rust for Rubyists uh, that I wrote, like I said, I wrote down what I learned as I wrote it, was some of the first documentation that existed for Rust. So a lot of people have learned the language because of me. Right? So I uh, wrote a lot of the initial documentation so pe in the actual language itself, so people will be able to see those kinds of things. I've contributed a couple other patches in certain areas where, you know, if you ever wondered, like, who wrote the JSON implementation in your library, right? Someone who was speaking earlier said, oh, I wrote the JSON implementation for Python, right? You could be that guy for a programming language that's as early along as Rust. You can't because we already have JSON, but you could pick something else um, and be, like, the person who wrote the first X, right? So. Um, Anyway, so that's one of the reasons why I enjoy getting involved in a programming language this early. And if that kind of thing is attractive to you, you may want to check out Rust as well. It definitely, it's, what else is interesting about the timeline of stability with Rust is that if you pick a brand new programming language, there's no guarantee that it's not going to go away. But since you have Mozilla and Samsung super hard committing to Rust, I'm pretty confident that it is going to be a language that is going on in the future. So it's not like you're going to waste a bunch of time into a language that does not actually um, end up being used by anyone. So that's also super cool. Um, okay, so that's all the meta stuff about Rust and why you should care about Rust and some of the details about Rust. Um, so now let's talk about 10 things that I want to show you that you could use to learn about Rust code and sort of what it's like. The very first thing is functions. That is super tiny. Hold on one sec. So this is hello world, um, and this is used to define functions. So you can see that um, fn, main, parentheses, curly braces, println, hello world, um, and semicolon. So this is sort of the simplest Rust program that does something of worth. Um, and you know, of course, if you don't start off with hello world, then you've ruined your entire career in that language, right? Like you must do hello world. So here's hello world. Um, so yeah, fn for functions. Um, Rust does a little teeny bit of this abbreviating things. Basically, it would suck. You define so many functions that it would sort of suck to type function, 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 function. So it's fn. Um, but there's been some back and forth about that. But it's going to be fn now forever. Um, so this is sort of the simplest possible thing. Um, in this instance, this is a function that takes no arguments and has no return type. If we wanted a function that did those kinds of things, it would look like this. Whatever, my annotation's wrong because I don't have the file type set. But um, this would be a function that takes one parameter, i, that has a type of integer and returns an integer. So that's sort of the basic syntax of how functions look. OK, functions. Variables. Also, I should say this too. Um, I think it would be cool if, since this is sort of new programming language stuff, if you have any questions about this as I go over it, just interrupt me and I will be happy to explain stuff to you. So go ahead. Yes. You didn't use variable warning in the last function you defined? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so there's a style guide. It is four spaces, no tabs, um, is the indentation for that particular thing. Um, thank you. Good question. So, uh, variables. No, it's awesome. Like, as a Rubyist, I was like, please just pick something and make everyone do the exact same thing. I don't care what it is. Um, and then I fought for two spaces and ended up being four. What? Yes. So the Rust compiler has a pretty print flag that will probably work most of the time. Um, at 1.0, it will work 100% of the time. But yeah, it will print them out according to the style guide. Yes. Sorry, yeah. So the question was, is there a, Go, is there a format thing like Go format, which I think is super awesome, one of the best parts about Go. And um, will you get unused variable warnings? And you will. And what's the spacing? And that's uh, four spaces instead of the default vim, which is eight, like we're in the 70s or something. OK. So variables. Um, Okay, so now it'll give me good spacing. So uh, 
let num equals one um, is basically how you define variables. So use the let keyword to define things. One other interesting thing to notice about this is that it is immutable. So this is not a mutable variable. If I wanted a mutable integer value, it would be mute. So you say that this is mutable. So everything's immutable by default. Um, if I wanted to declare the types, it can infer the types properly, but if I wanted to declare them, it would look like this. Sort of like that function definition thing above. Okay, so that's variables. Um, on to more interesting and exciting things, vectors. So um, vectors are sort of like arrays or lists, depending on which team you're on in other programming languages. So you can have a vector of integers, you can have a vector of strings, um, whatever you want. They have to be of the same type, I believe, but types can be, uh, you can make things that are different that implement the same trait, which is something I'll talk about later. So sort of like an interface in Java, if you've ever used Java, right? You can have an array of something that has the same interface and it's the same type, and that's types. Um, okay, mutation, talked about this already, yes. Yes, it does desugaring lets. Uh, um, I'll show you that in a minute. Um, so mutation, we already talked about. Add mute to the keyword to get mutation. Um, closures, so this is super cool. Rust supports closures, um, which you can end up using in many ways, sort of like uh, Ruby's block, but I'll show you just a raw one here. So double in this case is a closure that uh, takes one parameter x of type int and returns an int that's x plus two, and then let x equals double five, this calls the closure. There's a little bit of change going on in closures and some of the semantics. Um, it looks like there's gonna be closures and procedures that do not actually capture over their environment for various reasons. Uh, for more details about that, you can read the mailing list stuff. Um, it's complicated. Um, but basically, what you would expect, um, for now, anyway. Um, iteration, so one of the cool things that you can do uh, is it has a lot of cool iterator stuff. So in this case, uh, we take an array of numbers, one and two, and we call dot iter, which returns an iterator over that vector, and then we have a map function that takes a reference to x, I'll talk about references later, just whatever, don't worry about it, and returns x times two minus one. So this is now a new vector, which has just the odd, uh, or has, why is it called odds? I don't know, whatever, this is, I may have put a bad variable name, I was combining a couple different examples together, but this would take one and two and turn it into one and four, three, three. Yeah, cool. <laughs> Math is hard. Um, but you get iterators and all that kind of full stuff. Um, tasks, so. So uh, we're gonna talk about tasks. Basically tasks are end to end mapped lightweight threads. Um, and that's the primary method of concurrency in Rust. So uh, in this case, we're still doing the same math. These examples kind of build on each other. Um, so for the numbers in the odds, um, sort of Python style looping construct, um, do spawn. Uh, spawn is a function that takes a closure and returns a task, or re not doesn't return a task, but executes a task. So this will basically spin up one task for every element in this array and then print out you know, foo says hello from a lightweight thread, and there's some, there's an array access that's off the screen that looks exactly like you would expect. Um, I don't wanna mess with it because I'm gonna, I wanna move on before we do stuff, but do spawn curly brace and curly brace gives you a task. Um, and there's tons of stuff about tasks. Uh, you can have supervising tasks that supervise other tasks. We can do inner task communication, which we're gonna talk about here real quick. So um, part two. I think I'm gonna stop copying this because it's taking a long time, so uh, I'll post the slides later, but um, you can get channels to talk between tasks. So for example, here's the desugaring let statement too. So if I make a stream that has a port and a channel of ints, I get them back. Um, I can have some sort of expensive computation and then set in the task and then send that back to the parent. And then here I uh, listen to the port to get the result back from, it was calculated in the task. So this is just like executing something in the background, communicating between tasks. However, this would copy the any variable values that we send over the channel and that sucks. So um, we have some better stuff that I'm gonna talk about in a minute. Um, generics, so uh, this has a really, really terrifying type signature, but it's not actually that bad. 
Um, so this is how you would implement map in Rust if you wanted to write it yourself. So map takes a T and a U, uh, and it has a vector of Ts, and a function that takes in a, a, a vector of Ts and returns a U, and then you get a vector of Us back, right? So that's a simple application of map. But basically, you define types. If you, if you want to make it generic over something, um, you just use this kind of square bracket, or cur, not square bracket, but um, less than, greater than notation for generic stuff. Um, and then traits are another um, interesting aspect that sort of ties into generics. So um, you can define traits that imp are basically a list of methods that some sort of thing implements. So in this case, um, let x equals 5, display x, let y equals hello, display y, and then this function takes a generic type t that implements the toStir trait. And the toStir trait says that there's a toString method implemented on it, so x of type t, print len, x to string. If you left off the trait definition, it would blow up because it says, I can't guarantee that the thing actually implements the toStir method. So um, this allows you to do like polymorphism on you know, certain method types. Um, okay, pointers. You, this is the f one of the features that's most innovative of Rust, so people talked about it a lot, but the problem is that they're complicated and it makes Rust sound scary. So you almost never need to use pointers in Rust. Um, but if you do, they're there and they're awesome. So in this instance, um, I am going to copy this to make it a little bit bigger because punctuation involved. Okay, so let x be a pointer to int that's a pointer to 5. This is totally useless, but I wanted to keep it simple for the example. Um, and then the asterisk, um, you know, dereferences the pointer, x plus 5 is 10, convert that to a string and print it out. Now what's cool about this pointer is, um, you don't actually need to malloc and free. So you can think about the compiler thinks about where x is in scope and then inserts a malloc before and a free afterwards. So this is a pointer to memory, but it is impossible to screw up the amount of memory you're allocating and it's impossible to reference it after it has been deallocated. So this is one of Rust's primary strengths is that it makes it impossible to shoot yourself in the foot, right? Some people say that C++ is like giving a loaded gun and then pointing it at your feet for you. Um, so Rust tries to make it impossible to write bad code. Um, it is actually impossible to get null pointers. Null does not exist in the language because null sucks. So don't use nulls. Um, so anyway, pointers part two. So here's the example of uh, why some of this like ownership semantics is interesting. So uh, let x equals a pointer to five and then spin up a task where we print out the value of x and then down here also try to print out the value of x. So this is a problem, and this is a problem in almost every programming language, and this is where I think Rust's big strength truly is, and that's basically that um, this is sharing state across a concurrency boundary. That's bad. So Rust gives you a compile time error saying, hey buddy, you used an X after you gave it to one of your tasks. You're not allowed to do that. Um, so it actually throws an error on this line because you're accessing the variable after the concurrency happened. So concurrency across the boundary, compile time error. That's like music to my ears. Um, personally. Maybe I'm just weird. Um, if you do need to share data, so I mentioned channels copy data over, this is sort of a more complicated example using atomic reference counting or ARC. So basically, uh, this is a really stupid complicated math equation that's mega scary. It doesn't matter. The point is, is that you're folding over um, a list. So I'm computing some values. I need to compute it for the entire list. I also want to spin up a bunch of tasks to compute a bunch of different numbers. So I don't want to copy this massive array. So in this case, this makes a vector um, out of a big number. Um, a big number of elements, right? So we wouldn't want to share that massive amount of data or copy it between all of our tasks. So what we do is we uh, build an arc out of that vector, and then we actually send a clone of the arc down the channel. So now we're only copying this reference to the container rather than um, copying the whole container itself, and the data is actually immutable, so it's okay for the tasks to work on everything because you cannot share mutable stuff across boundaries, only immutable data. So that helps. Yes? I believe that that is true. Now, I, there's something about, I think that arc is 100% the same as Objective-C. There's something about cycles in the reference counting stuff that I think is true in this case and not true in one of the other variants of this. Um, so probably, yes. So arc makes automatic reference counting. Yes, it does. I thought I said that, but maybe I didn't, sorry. Arc is automatic reference counting. So that was 10 things. We're gonna do one more, which is a bonus, bonus round um, match. So 
Uh, Rust has a match statement, which uh, can be used sort of to match patterns on things. So for example, um, this grabs a line from standard in, and because you may or may not actually get input, um, it, this match statement, we want to say that uh, we're going to convert from a string to an int, and that might not be possible, right? If I type the letter F or the letter Z, it's not going to know how to convert that to an integer. So what happens is that returns a uh, option integer, which if you're familiar with functional languages, basically have a sum integer and then a none case. So if we have an integer, then it prints this out. If we don't have an integer, it prints this out. What's cool about this and what makes this better than other languages, um, or at least non-functional languages, is if you leave this none case out, it's a compile time error. Forces you to handle every possible case and be exhaustive. Um, so that's super cool, um, especially for handling errors. Okay, I'm basically out of time, so what I'm gonna tell you about is how to learn more if this stuff sort of intrigues you. Um, Basically, there is two introductions as of right now, the official tutorial and mine. Um, mine is better, theirs is more comprehensive. So um, I'm actually working on replacing that tutorial right now, so, but in the moment. Um, the official tutorial is more like this presentation where it's a random list of features. My tutorial is like building a project through stuff. So um, we're working on merging those two things together, but right this moment, they're separate. Um, there's tons of ways to get involved in discussions. So there's a dev, Rust dev mailing list. There's a subreddit, r Rust, that I literally made a special Reddit account just for because I hate Reddit. But uh, there's good discussion there. So I'm Steve Klavnik one on Reddit because uh, I deleted my Reddit account a long time ago. There's pound Rust on irc.mozilla.org. There's also pound Rust on Freenode, which no one actually talks in, but a ton of people idle in. Um, so go to the one on mozilla.org instead, the official one. And there's a This Week in Rust that sort of gives you the updates of what happened in the language in the last week. So someone goes through and curates all the pull requests and news and things. Um, and then finally, the code for Rust is on github.com, Mozilla Rust, so you can go check it out um, there and all that stuff. So um, thank you so much for listening to me and having me here, and uh, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions you have within whatever time limit I have left. So. Thanks. Four more minutes, so four quick questions, however many questions that is, I'm gonna shut up, yes. So in your map example, you had an array that you kept pushing to. Is there a way to pre-size that array uh, to the expected size so you're not uh, allocating it? Yeah, yeah, I am 90% sure that, that is, there is a way to do it, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I, so I've been learning rest literally by going in the IRC and just asking really dumb questions and not being afraid to, and everyone is super happy that you care, so they give you answers. So you could go into our Rust and, or into the IRC and ask that, and they would be like, oh yes, let me explain it to you at great length. Um, the, the language actually has a don't be an asshole policy built into the language, so there's like a code of conduct for the project. So everyone is super amazing. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, I like that. I like people not being jerks. Be nice. Yes. Awesome. I'm psychic. Why, uh, why, do you, uh, why is it necessary to um, specify that this key uh, has a true string, right? Why can't you just say uh, in anything that's a true string? I will do the, well, so, wait. So, oh, you mean putting it like here instead of here? It's because you may reuse, oh, I'm sorry? Basically, leaving out the, the generic key thing involved and using Right, so things could implement multiple types, or you could have multiple arguments that need different kinds of types. So you can think of this as like defining the names. So imagine that this took three arguments and it, they needed two traits. So you then say T is to stir and R is to stir and this, and then the first one is this and the second one is that. Like it's because of the more complicated examples, yes. Yes. Yeah, so I programmed in D for years, um, and uh, Facebook actually just committed some D to their repository the other day, and I'm really excited about that. The differences um, largely are around the fact that D is, uh, so this is not actually true, but in practice this is true, you need garbage collectors for D. Um, you do not need to use a garbage collector in Rust. So um, that means that, and, but I've written an operating system in D, so it's not strictly true, but you basically lose the entire language in D. Um, D is trying to be a better C++, uh, Rust is trying to be an ML for systems programming, which is like a subtle but important shift. Um, 
Also, D sort of, the problem I have with D is actually entirely social and marketing. So D has existed for a really long time. Um, back when I was involved in D, there was a whole ton of drama. There was two standard libraries. There was three different compilers, and you never knew which one was being actively developed at the time. And so at some point, I just stopped caring. Um, and so I hear that all that's fixed now, but I've personally kind of moved on. So I think that a lot of people that were involved in D four or five years ago kind of feel that way. Um, so that is what it is. Um, I think D is really cool, and if it makes you happy, you should program in it. But um, that's sort of how I would compare them, yes. Around, uh, they come from different like angles on the same problem, but they're definitely in the exact same space, for sure. Yes? How is the path that down in Ruby? Uh, I don't know how much faster it is than Ruby, but by a lot. It's like within 20% of C++ speed today. Um, it, it compiles to LLVM, so we take advantage of all the LLVM optimization stuff, um, and there's a lot of work to do even more than that. But ideally, it should be C speed or possibly even faster um, due to complicated things. Yes? Uh, do you have to specify uh, the return type in the function explicitly, or can it be inferred by, say, the last expression? Uh, it has to be, it, it was, the decision was made that it has to be declared because basically uh, that's documentation, right? The type signature of the function. So it's better to have it there than not have it there. Um, so that was sort of a social choice that was made rather than the, but yeah, totally. Yes? Any bridge is from Ruby or FFI or? Yeah, so Rust has super fantastic FFI and actually um, I tried to compile Ruby as a shared object and then load it in Rust FFI and then spin up a Ruby interpreter and then call some Ruby stuff in it and it seg faults right now. So I'm almost there. Um, but there is, there is someone who wrote a Ruby gem that is implemented in Rust that exposes itself to Ruby properly and it did work as of like six months ago. So it probably doesn't work today but could in theory work. Um, so yeah, uh, and that's a really interesting like totally bridges between the two. But FFI is super mega easy in Rust. Really, really easy. Cool. All right. Thank you for a great conference, everyone.